Yeah, I think some people think that, well, this is, well, you know, I was cheated on or I was, you know, whatever. And now this is my time. So I need to go to trial because I'm going to get my say and everyone's going to be, it's going to know, right? That's not really what divorce is usually about, right? All right, and we're live. Hi, friends. Welcome to My Divorce Real Estate. I'm Amber Gifford, and this is my husband and teammate, Scotty Gifford. And today we have back with us Mike Day, a certified uh, family law attorney here in the Houston area. And Mike, why don't you give us a little bit of information on you, and then we'll jump into our, we're doing a client intake video. Sure. Thank you, Scotty. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a board certified in family law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization, and I have been practicing family law in the Houston area um, since 2008. But uh, before that, I was a small town prosecutor, and I also worked in Austin uh, handling civil litigation. Awesome. Nice. Well, thanks for being here. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. So today, I know everybody has the same question. Like, what is it going to happen when I go meet with an attorney? And what questions do I ask? And what does this mean? And so I thought it might just be beneficial for you to kind of go over what an intake looks like when you bring someone in and just, you don't have to go into depth, but talk about the things that you discuss with them so they know what to expect. So maybe it lowers the fear level a little bit. Sure. So it just kind of depends on the issues in the case and where the person is coming from. I mean, if, if, if I'm meeting with the spouse who understands the finances, um, there might be a lot more nitty gritty conversation about how certain accounts get divided, what an inventory spreadsheet looks like, because they're not there for handholding or general knowledge about the legal system. They just kind of, those are the questions they want answered. Um, if I'm meeting with the spouse who um, is not a uh, privy to the finances, then there's a lot more general conversation about what does it look like to divide a 401k or what does it look like to uh, separate accounts, get a house sold or what you would have to do to stay in a house. Right. And there are all sorts of different ways of, uh, of examining that. Um, sometimes, you know, both spouses will be, accomplished professionals, but one will work for a large company and one will have their own business. And so when you have divorces that involve someone who's self-employed, then uh, things can get a lot more complicated depending upon what the nature of that underlying business is, how it's valued. Um, if there are other considerations, you know, that sort of thing. Hmm. Awesome. So let's pretend like, um, female client, wife, stay at home, mom, doesn't know anything about the money, doesn't know where to find it, comes to you. I was told I need to retain an attorney. I have two kids. What's going to happen to my kids? What, what, what do I need to know? Well, you need to have, to the extent that you can, you will have need to have given some long, hard thoughts about what does it look like to put your kids first in this process and how do you work backwards from that? Because that's probably, aside from just being able to put a roof over your head and the, and the children's heads, that's really what you're most concerned about, right? I mean, you're not you're not so much worried about survival, but you are worried about how, how do I get my kids through this, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's the high wage earning spouse or not, or if they earn equal wages, um, a lot of times there's going to be somebody who is less inclined to get a divorce. And so that is a different type of process, right? Because if you have someone who's less inclined to get a divorce, then, you know, you start making some inquiries as the attorney about making sure that they're doing what they can to take care of themselves. Because a cortisol brain is very real. If people are, are going through some sort of trauma, that's going to really impact their ability to conceptualize what it means to put their kids first and work backwards from that. Um, you know, you, you sometimes people get vindictive in this process, mm -hmm. which is generally speaking counterproductive. Um, and so um, 
you know, you just kind of want to know where they're at emotionally. Right. So mm -hmm. what if though, let me ask you this, let's back up even further. Okay. What does it look like when someone comes in and they don't know about a petition? When is it filed? How long is the waiting period? Do they, does he have to be served? Does he, I mean, I know the answers to these, but, but like most people don't like they're going right. to you and they're wondering, does he get to get the kids? Can I choose my time? Like, yeah. Cause that's scary. I think for a lot of us is, you know, we've never been through a divorce, right? Most people haven't right. been divorced before. And so they just get, they get all these, there's all these unknowns. Right. And obviously maybe they did a little researching online and, but or maybe talk to a friend. Uh, I hear a lot. Does he have to be served? papers well he does unless he agrees not to be okay right? that's and, a good and, answer. and so and, and you know what and honestly that's a great question because if there is any sort of history of abuse i mean one of the most dangerous times in the victim's life is when the mm. abusive spouse is served with papers yeah scary right? mm -hmm. that that is yeah and and lawyers need to be vigilant about that and and during the intake process if there is a history of abuse it, it needs to be shared. Um, Absolutely. That's a whole different heightened situation. But I think that is a like going to an attorney, you're asking, OK, I'm going to retain you and I've retained you. And what um, we there's a petition that you fill out, you know, then they go into temporary orders. Do you want to explain what temporary orders are? Sure. So for the most part, they um, they're think of them as kind of like a band-aid they're there to kind of keep everything together before the divorce is finalized right and you might even have something right before the interim the temporary orders that sometimes are actually called a band-aid order but they both kind of work in similar ways um and they're generally there also to make sure that the status quo remains in place unless there's something really problematic about the status quo now um, and that's in terms of finances and who's going to live in the house and where the kids are going to go to school and that sort right. of thing. And now, don't go buy one a car, right? Like, don't go drain your bank account, buy a car, crazy stuff like that. Right. I mean, well, look, I mean, you got to look at what you what you need to, right? I mean, sure. sometimes, you know, I had a client one time who bought a house, right? But that's because he had four kids and it was cheaper to buy a house than it was to rent an apartment. Right. And he had the ability to do it. So why not do it? Right. You know? um, but but yeah, you generally don't want to do anything extreme. Um, you also I mean, I say it's to keep the status quo, but and we kind of touched upon this in, in one of the other um, uh, Zooms. But the idea is that some things will change. And one of the things that are most likely to change will be that both parents will get to spend time with the kids in a meaningful way, unless, you know, there's substance abuse issues, or violence issues, you know, something along those lines. But putting that aside, you know, the uh, Texas law presumes that you're going to get what's called the standard possession order mm -hmm. with elections. That's about 42 percent of the year. So that's really what people that's sort of the default. And a lot of times people like to negotiate something more akin to a 50 50. And so, and that happens too. And, you know, I mean, people feel differently about this, but I mean, I, I, I think in the right situation that can make a lot of sense. Sure. So it's more like you go file a petition, they get served, you have a temporary order orders hearing on the mm -hmm. maybe, and then um, you're working towards your mediation, unless you can come to the table in advance with all, everything agreed upon, which, isn't always likely, but, um, I did have a question in there about, um, I, I often hear people say to, in regards to the, like, I want to have sole custody. And my answer to them is, well, this may be really crass, but like, unless you have a video of them shooting up heroin, you're probably not going to get that. Like, <laughs> that's what I tell them. Cause I'm like, you know, everybody deserves the right to be with their kids. If there's abuse and there's horrible things going on for sure, tell your attorney and all that. But like, and can you explain a little bit between primary conservator and non so they understand that it's kind of the same when you have the heads, meds, and eds that they you could talk a little bit about that? Right. So generally speaking, one parent will get to choose the primary residence mm -hmm. of um, the children. And uh, that kind of goes hand in hand, although you 
depending on how it's drafted, it could technically be different. But that typically goes hand in hand with where the kids are going to go to school. And for the most part, uh, parents want the children to remain at the same school. Now, if the kids are in private school, uh, sometimes that's hard during this process. Um, but, you know, private school is different because that's that's not nearly as dependent on where where somebody lives. Right. Um, so that's that's what that's what the primary that the exclusive right to designate the primary residence is technically what it's called. Okay. Um, and the other thing that kind of goes along with that right, typically, is the right to receive child support, you know, and that's really where sometimes people kind of get bogged down on that. Um, and I don't I don't want to get too far afield on that. But um, but the other thing I would say in terms of client intake is temporary orders is an absolutely crucial step in this process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't appreciate this, but it's effectively like having a final trial in 45 days. I mean, you you know, if you guys, if the parties cannot reach an agreement at mediation, because pretty much pretty much all the courts in the Houston area um, require mediation, mediation before hearing a temporary orders hearing. Right. But if you guys, if, if folks cannot enter into an agreement on all issues, then that means that some things have to get decided by the court. Right. Right. And uh, very rarely people will will are content to remain in limbo land where there's no final or temporary resolution. Right. But that's, that's pretty rare. Generally speaking, you're going to get an agreement. That is true about 90% of the time. And the other 10% of the time or so you're going to the court and one of two things will happen. Either you will have a hearing or you will reach an agreement right before the hearing starts because people are out in the hallway Scared. horse trading Right. Um, and that up. happens some, too. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was better hurry up. They're there. They're going to bring it to the yeah, table. That's right. Then, yeah. And sometimes it happens that way. And that's OK. I mean, yeah. I've seen some really good outcomes happen that way. And one of the ways to maximize your chances of being successful is that when you think you actually are going to have a court date, that you're prepared to go. So yeah. that means your lawyer yeah. has spent several hours with you preparing your testimony, kind of role playing what it might feel like to be cross examined. Right. Yeah. Because most people that. Um, have don't know what that's going to be like. Right. Yeah. And it is very much the complete opposite of a natural, organic conversation. Hmm. And sometimes people just want to add in and chime and be completely truthful. And that's that's not exactly cross-examination. I mean, cross-examination, you're asked leading questions that more often than not are phrased in such a way to where, you know, there's a very obvious answer. And if you don't give, and that answer would confirm the other side's hypothesis. Right. And if you give a different answer, the way the question's phrased, it's just going to look, make you look bad. So I loved also that you said about, you know, having your attorney should be sitting down with you role playing to me, that goes back to one of our other videos with, you know, picking a good attorney. Like if they're not going to sit down with you and ask, hey, are you going to have a meeting before mediation? There's so many attorneys out there and our clients. So they're like, no, I haven't even talked to them. I guess we're meeting tomorrow. And I'm going, oh <laughs> my gosh, like, like yeah. question to be asked, will you coach me before mediation? So I love that you offer that piece up because it's important. You don't know what to expect. And Scotty and I have a video on mediation, what to expect when you're going in, because a lot of people have no idea. And why would you? We don't expect you to. So that's right. why we do this. And I talk a lot. I know going back to uh, child support, we don't want to dive deep into it, but we do have a child support calculator that follows the Texas OAG on our website as well, that you can calculate child support that this genius over here made with all his other calculators. So yeah, I just put it on there because it's just wanted to, one more tool for us to have whether you're time. receiving or you're going to have to be giving it, it right. based off you know that info but i think that's all really important information i mean i think most people don't know what to expect they don't realize that there's temporary orders they think it means you know hey you're gonna and you, they can't hit me and i'm like okay yeah no that's not what that means <laughs> well that's part of what that means you know um but it's not just that. You're right. Right. Yeah. So I don't think they understand that. And I've also another. Um... Well, I think it's sometimes it's all the legalese gets it gets scary, right? As me being mm -hmm. a layman and not knowing all these divorce terms and and what this means, primary custodial and, you know, and uh, 
temporary restraining orders and it's like oh well I, don't, well I didn't do anything wrong like why don't you be restrained and what you know why right. is that, you know so it's like there are a lot of these terms that do are scary uh, and so it's just like to help you know say hey this is a normal process these are normal things we're doing and this is like you're still gonna have your time and you're still gonna, like it, i'm i know we haven't dove too deep into this video but i think it's important that we say hey like you know you you have rights as a parent right and you have rights as even if you don't have children you have rights to your assets and your your yeah. your your community property right so you will the court's not just going to rip everything away from you because of your situation right no matter what that is right unless it's like right yeah unless there's something you know it's going to be status quo with the exception of spending more time with the kids you know if, if that wasn't your primary domestic uh division of labor uh, unless there's something just really really problematic about the right. status quo I do want to touch to you that you specifically are very knowledgeable and specialized to you with um, high conflict cases where maybe you have a special needs child. Um, I know you've done a lot of that too. And so we off, we know people that specialize um, with working with families that do have special needs kids because it is a long-term care that people don't always think about. And, and when thinking about even child support, they don't think about like you know, I, I, everyone always asks, can I get their college paid for? I'm like, you can agree to whatever you want to agree to, but I've not seen it a lot. But when you have special needs or some, a child with a disability, like there's care that goes well beyond the average number of years that we consider our children adults. Right. And right. specialize in that. And I, I wanted to touch on that. So people know that about you specifically here in Houston. Texas. Oh. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I love working special needs cases because there's, you know, there, there's a special place in my heart for that. And um, and the legal issues are can be nuanced and a lot of lawyers are not as experienced. Um, the other thing I would say is that about college and 529s, yeah. that that is that is something that you really want to try to get addressed. Because, um, I mean, if the 529s, that money is already there, there's certain language that can that should be used. Um, people can enter into contractual obligations to pay for college in the future. They don't have to, right. um, but they but they can. Um, it, technically, it's something the court can consider in dividing the estate. Although, depending upon what court you're in, um, that may or may not be a, a factor weighed very heavily by the court. But just How know is, that. Yes. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish your thought. Sorry. Well, just, you know, just know from a preparing for an intake perspective, mm -hmm. well, be prepared to say this is too much information for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because sure, you don't yeah. want it, you don't want to overwhelm somebody because that's the thing. I mean, this day and age, sometimes a lot of people have been spending months thinking about this and rereading about it on the internet, watching YouTube videos. And so they, they really want certain nuanced questions answered. Other folks, you start getting into the weeds with them and that's not where they need to be. And, right. and you just have to let the lawyer whom you're speaking with know that because I mean, I, me personally, I'm a big believer in that you have to take people where you find them. And, you know, meet them where they are. You and some too. people are ready for the weeds to get into the weeds and other people aren't. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with initially being very befuddled by this process, being confused, mm -hmm. right? Um, not just from a legal standpoint, but from an emotional and psychological standpoint. Those are all very natural feelings to have. And you shouldn't feel you know, a person shouldn't feel bad that they have those feelings. Right. Not I, at all. Oh, it is very emotional. Do you have something you want to add? I know you do. No, I mean, I think that's, <laughs> I think it was just a good, I appreciate everything you guys both said on this and topic is like, you know, when we're doing this intake, it's just, uh, when you're coming to the first time, it's like, you're just, you're, you could be a deer in headlights. Right. And we just, For you know, sure. so it's, it's nice to know that you can, as an attorney, you know, Mike is here to like, Hey, meet, he will meet you where you're at. And that's what we try to do the gift group too. We try to, Hey, we're going to help you with the real estate side is where we specialize. But like, we know that we 
can't speak to all these other things, you know, to the level that Mike is, and we're not attorneys. So we always say, Hey, like, let's, we'll get you, we'll hear the story and we'll go, okay, well, it's not like you need an attorney to to, to, to carry carry on the rest of this case. So sometimes they'll have a little bit of knowledge that we share with them, but then it's like, okay, but you got to go to the expert or you got to go to go to the attorney and get the rest of them. And then they will ask you those other questions that they need to dive into. And so you always prompt them with kind of the questions they need to know or questions you need to know when that was intakes, right? Yes. I mean, a big part of it is also is I, I try to be mindful that I don't give too much information. I don't want to overwhelm someone. Right. You know that that's counterproductive. So sometimes, you know, but you want someone to walk away from that process feeling heard and you want them to walk away from that process feeling more informed. Absolutely. And those are those are the two major, major goals. And then you know, to the extent that the client retains you or retains the lawyer, you want there to be a um, a frank conversation about expectations, right? Because you don't what you don't want to do, and when some lawyers do this, unfortunately, is that they overpromise and they say, "Oh yeah, I can do this, I'll do that." Um, some realtors, and, yeah, do that they're going to pay your attorney's fees, and it's like, well, and sometimes you know. Sometimes some of that gets lost in translation, right? I mean, sometimes, you know, I mean, like in a divorce, yeah, the community estate will pay for the attorney's fees, right? right. I mean, the attorney's fees will get paid. Does that, does that mean that the other spouse is paying for it? Well, I mean, yes and no. Right, yeah. <laughs> right? I hear are both kind of paying for it. You know, that's, that's just really... sort of the... That's a good question because people do ask me that all the time. Like, well, can he pay for this? I'm like, well, it's community funds. It depends on how y'all work it out and what kind of attorney and what you discuss and all that. I do have a question though, because I've heard this from other attorneys that we work with. um, And, and maybe this is just a good piece of information here. Another perspective. I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer, but when you agree to something in a temporary order, I have been told, make sure I've heard two things. One, those are coming from attorneys. It's temporary orders. Don't worry about it. We can change it later. It's just temporary to get you to the next mediation. That's the first thing. The second piece of that I've heard, which is the complete opposite, is don't agree to anything in temporary orders that you wouldn't want to agree to permanently because then the judge could look back and go, well, why? You agreed to it before. Why is it a problem now? What would be your take on that? Generally, the latter. So courts are going, so, you know, going back to it, is it a, is it a, a band-aid order? Or is it a true temporary order? Right. Mm-hmm. Cause sometimes those terms are used interchangeably, but sometimes they're used with really kind of different intentions. Mm-hmm. Um, if something is immediate um, and you haven't gone to mediation, the courts are going to be less deferential to that. Okay. But if you, if you reach an agreement on temporary orders and then you want something very different and final, you better have a very good reason why, because you're absolutely right. Um, that, that kind of sets the standard for what's going to happen in the case. And can you you give an example on that? I mean, sure. I mean, (laughs) I've seen a case where, you know, mom and dad or husband and wife agreed on who was going to be primary on a temporary basis. Mm -hmm. And then the case was pending for a while. Um, And I've seen in two instances where the, where it went to trial and the trial judge said, well, I know that one, you guys agreed that one parent was going to be primary, but I'm going to make a a different parent primary now, because now you guys aren't in agreement. Right. And that had to do with some pretty meaningful concerns about the losing parents' parenting capacity, mm. right? Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I just wanted to get clarification for my own self because I like to have knowledge because knowledge is power. And I want to be repeating the right things. And most of the stuff I get is from the attorneys that we work with and you included. And I thought it was important to clarify that is there anything else you want to add in regards to your first meeting or just any scary story, anything, maybe you have some story. I can tell a story. (laughs) I always have a story. Uh, I will just share mine's really quick and easy and it's not funny, but it was, it's funny now. Um, how I had set appointments with attorneys, I was contemplating divorce and 
I decided to go meet with an attorney and pay my consultation fee, which I had to take extra money out when I got groceries because like he did all the bills and I had to go downtown to meet this attorney. Had never driven downtown by myself before. Didn't know where to park. Ended up something happened to my car and it wouldn't start and I couldn't get back in time to go get the kids. And then it turned into, I had to tell a lie, which I'm not even a fib person. Like I ended up telling him the truth because I just couldn't stand the thought of, I told a lie about where I was. And so like, it, it just goes to show you that we're all human and we all are trying to get educated in this situation and be wise about your choices. And nowadays, and there's zooms and all that kind of stuff back when I got a divorce, there wasn't, but, um, I can laugh about it now, but I was freaking out. (laughs) I was freaking out. I was like, like, not only is he going to know, but I can't get my kids. And it was horrible. You weren't so lucky, were you? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Mike, do you have something you want to share? Well, I just, so when you're going, when people are going through the intake process, just remember two things. One, be organized. And two, um, you know, and practice self-care. It's very important. If you've been traumatized, um, this can be easily overwhelming. This can easily be triggering. And um, there's a book I started to read called uh, a Trauma. Oh, gosh. Hold on. Let me. I. I. Sure. We're all about books. Scott and I are Truth books. and Repair Truth by and repair? Judith Herman. Truth and Repair. Um, she is a she basically pioneered trauma studies. She's a, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And so her most recent book is examining how the justice system is perceived by victims of trauma. And wow. I think in reading it, it kind of gives me a greater understanding of sort of unstated assumptions or expectations. And, you know, her studies on trauma really involve domestic violence, but I, I, you know, you don't have to have that type of situation for there to be trauma. You can have betrayal trauma. You can have um, just an accumulation of sort of low level narcissistic abuse that is just as traumatizing. And so it's been very interesting to start that book. I'm only on the second or um, about almost to chapter three now, but it's been insightful because one of the things that it says is that trauma survivors want there to be public accountability of their perpetrator. And, you know, if the facts are bad enough, you're going to get that in court, you know, whether or not you find that to be a cathartic experience is another inquiry, but a lot of times in family court, at least in Houston, you're not necessarily going to get that. And it'll be interesting to see as I read the book, you know, if there's any sort of feedback about what happens when people don't get that public reckoning that they feel like they need. Deserve, right? right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think some people think that, well, this is, well, you know, I was cheated on or I was, you know, whatever. And now this is my time. This I need to go to trial because I'm going to get my say and everyone's going to be, it's going to know. Right. That's not really what divorce is usually about. Right. Um, Rarely is it about. I mean, let's be real. (laughs) Cheating. Uh, Because I hear this all the time, too. Like, yes, it's cause for what blew up maybe your marriage. But like, uh, just give us a little insight on it. I mean, does it at the end of the day, like I understand pornography and other things, but like my spouse was just cheating like give us a little insight there i know what you know what i'm trying to say <laughs> how, how yeah i mean that, how, really? how how does it how does it matter how does it inform the court process and part yeah. of it is it just kind of depends on what court you're in because there are some of these judges that do um they're they're harder about it than than the previous yeah. regime uh, to be quite honest you know okay. well, um fair enough but a lot of it they're not really going to care that much about unless one of two things, one, someone spent a lot of money. Right. Right. Okay. Or two, um, that the, the, they don't want the kids around the other woman or what. Right. Definitely. You know, that's especially on a temporary basis, or if there's, 
you know, there's some sort of underlying trauma or psychological right. or mental health dimension to that. Um, those are probably the, but, but I, I think go in assuming that unless your spouse has spent a meaningful amount of money on somebody else, um, that it's probably right. not going to matter that much. I yeah, it's not going to sway you. Probably, you so. know, and, and and unless you're just wanting to spend a lot of money on a jury trial as a matter of principle, um, and if if so, God bless you. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, well, I appreciate you it's saying that. Important I mean, not to have unrealistic expectations, right? I I really I, I hear that probably more than anything else. Cheating seems to be so prevalent these days with all the apps and the dating and being secretive and all of these things. And we're not underlying anyone's emotion or pain or anything else. No one knows another person's pain by any means. I just want them to know when they're like, well, he cheated. I deserve it. Just doesn't quite work that way. And and you know more than I do in regards to the courts. I mean maybe those people were cheated on too. And so they're harder on those people. I don't know, but I, I agree. Oh, no comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, well, I th- but it doesn't like, usually doesn't play out the way that, you know, well, they, think they cheated. Head. So yeah. I get 70% of the yes. assets, right? Yeah. That, that generally doesn't occur. Um, yeah. Not, Unless not quite like that. I mean, the one thing I'll say, and I was talking about this to a judge the other day, you know, there's this pressure to like get cases through the dockets faster. And my argument was, well, when you've had trauma and, and again, betrayal trauma is every bit as traumatic as any other kind of trauma. Why not give these people time? You know, if the lawyers aren't clamoring for trial dates, mm-hmm. presumably because their client doesn't want one. Right. Right. Why? Who is the judge to impose that on the parties? Right. Right. Well, I mean, who does that really serve? And frankly, if you want these cases to settle, if you if you don't want these cases to go to trial, you know, from a public policy perspective, and that's a legitimate concern because sometimes the trials themselves are traumatic. Now, sometimes right. you can't help but have them, you know, um, and admittedly, statistically speaking, that's kind of extraordinary, right? Because roughly 90 percent of cases settle. But right. If you want to maximize the chances for settlement, right, let these people, whether it's the anger or the hurt or the betrayal, let let time and talented mental yeah, health professionals yeah. assist with that recovery. So these these folks, you know, especially when it comes to kid related issues. I mean, it's oh, just yeah. it's just I mean, because the last thing you want is people to rush into a settlement and then they get upset about it you know, six months, a year later, and then there's another round of litigation, right? I mean, it's rare that that's, that serves people well, you know, I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable, right? Um, But I don't know. That's my soapbox. This is oddly familiar. This is oddly familiar. No, I agree. I, I, I like the soapbox talk. I like the real talk. I think it's, legitimate i mean i i do always encourage everyone to make a list of what your wants are what you think you need and prioritize them the top five or ten or whatever be realistic and know what you're going to negotiate on because at the end of the day your fallback is that decree and and things aren't good so it just depends on how people process but sometimes what i'll do is i'll have people write out their goals Mm -hmm. and then we'll write out to the side or use a highlighter and say this is a red light you're not going to get this. This is a yellow light. This is a maybe. This is a green light. Yeah, you're probably going to get this. Mm, And some some people find that helpful. Yeah, I would would have loved that. Okay, well, that's okay. Yeah, yes, that's something we can get you. And yes, this is something that maybe we can get you. But that don't over there, what you're asking for is your la-la land, right? And I, I think sometimes we need people like yourself to rein expectations back in because they're either angry, upset, and they want justification, but it's not realistically that that's going to happen right because realistically does you know like or do you get all the assets and the other one doesn't see the kids i mean there's cases always that you know prove the otherwise but it's usually you know and generally you see your would your perspective be that generally you see kind of we compromise and 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 at the end of the day and we kind of each side gives and takes right and we end up in mediation, oh. that's why majority. Of well, there, there, there's a cliche that the uh, sign of a good mediation is that both sides go away unhappy. So, <laughs> because 
that means that both people really compromised, you know? Yeah. You can't have everything. We tell everybody that all the time. You cannot have everything. You can have anything you want, but not everything you want. And you're going to have to share time and he is going to get to see the kids or she is going to get to have them. And I think we do, a, even though we are licensed real estate agents and he's a licensed lender, we do a lot of advising. We don't claim to be therapists or attorneys, but we do walk them off that ledge quite often just by our own real life experience. And I think it, we do a good job of it because it helps your job because then they don't come after you going, ah, or the time they get to you, they're a little bit more subdued and understanding of the process. So Yeah. I just try to always manage those expectations from our side too. And say, you know, you, like we always say, Hey, well, if you have no money and you're not getting support, you're probably not going to stay in that house, you know, unless he's agreeing to it. Right. So like, you're going to have to, you know, realize but that I want it. Yeah. <laughs> Realizing that life is changing after this is over, right? Right. right? You are your you're business and now you're dividing, right? And you're it's you're not going to have his one. income the whole way through, right? And you might get some support for a while, depending on how long you're married and if your children or whatever. But after a certain point, that's going to come to an end. And, you know, you're going to have to be able to fend for yourself at that point and get a job and start over and, and, and you know, begin begin again new. So, um, right. And beginning again is can be fabulous if you allow it. It's all what you choose. So, yeah. well, thank you so much for being with us again and sharing your knowledge and just expertise. We really appreciate your time, Mike. Yeah. And we'll thank put, you so much for having me. We'll put your information down below so they can contact you off this video. Um, and then, uh, you know, we like say, Ambers, want to wrap it up and we'll uh... like and subscribe. I'm supposed to say that. So, anyway, <laughs> thanks for joining us, friends. And as always, we're here to bring you real life experiences to all your real estate needs. Bye.